thank you so much for having me, Bang Bang Con. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. This is honestly my favorite programming conference in the world. I think this is the best crowd. Super excited to be here. Uh, also, this is not my phone. This is a Game Boy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so my name is Peter Sobot, and I'm here to talk about the time that I built the world's first ever Game Boy game with CD quality audio uh, to release a friend's album to make good on a dare. Uh, so, <laughs> this is my friend Marty. Uh, Marty's a musician from my hometown of Toronto. Uh, he goes by the stage name of Pusher, uh, at It's Pusher there on Twitter, and he makes music that he calls shiny and colorful. Now, a couple years ago, Marty was telling me he was preparing to release his next album. He sent me some of the album artwork, and it had all these nice little 8-bit doodles, uh, and there were some Game Boys in the background. And he also, uh, he doodled this little Game Boy that he turned into a pin, and it looked really cool. And he also mentioned that he wanted to release the album on vinyl and on cassette tape, because that was the new cool vintage thing that people were doing at the time. Now, this is where I made one fundamental mistake. I said this. I said, okay, wild idea. Let's release a Game Boy game with the album on it. Parts shouldn't cost more than $30. <laughs> Could be a super unique merch opportunity. I was young, I was naive, uh, but think about it. What other artist releases their music on Game Boy? Like, it's virtually never been done before. And if we could do it in a way that actually sounded good, uh, that would sell like hotcakes. It'd be amazing. Well, Marty agreed, and he said, oh, that's cool. <laughs> you think we can do it? And, uh, I mean, the game was on, no pun intended, but we had to do it from that point onwards. So, let's make sure we're all on the same page here. If you've never heard of the Game Boy, uh, it <laughs> It was uh, one of the best-selling video game consoles of all time. Uh, it was released in 1989, uh, 30 years ago now, and if you were a kid growing up in the 90s, you either owned one of these or desperately wanted to own one of these. Uh, yeah, it, it was amazing. <laughs> but when the engineers and designers working on the Game Boy were building it, uh, they had a big problem, and that was in 1989, computer chips cost a lot of money, and they didn't do nearly as much as they do today. In fact, to give you an idea of how weak they were, uh, the original Game Boy had only 64 kilobits of RAM in it. That's two million times less than this laptop right here. Uh, so it was fairly underpowered. Nintendo knew what to do with this, though. They had some tricks up their sleeve to make this work properly. They knew they wanted to have music in their games, so they put a speaker and a, uh, a stereo headphone jack in the Game Boy, but they also did the math and found out that if they wanted to have full CD quality audio, they could only store 0 0.185 seconds <laughs> worth of that audio on the cartridge, because storage was so expensive. So instead, they put a full synthesizer into the Game Boy. This is it on the schematic. Uh, it's a four-channel synthesizer, and instead of storing the actual audio with the real instruments and performances and vocals, they would just store essentially the sheet music or the MIDI file of the music that they wanted to play back. This made it way cheaper and possible to actually play sounds, but it was just bleeps and bloops and a bit of noise, and again, no vocals. Now, another strategy Nintendo used to make things cheaper and uh, more economical was to split their console into two parts. So the Game Boy itself won't really turn on unless you have a cartridge inserted, unless you actually have a game in there. And this is because the Game Boy has no storage, has no operating system. It's super, super dumb on its own. And the reason for that is because the cartridge actually does a lot of the work. The cartridge is a full circuit board with 32 pins on it that has to connect to the Game Boy for it to start up and start running, essentially. Each of these 32 pins does different things. Uh, some of them provide power, some of them provide synchronization, put data back and forth between the cartridge and the Game Boy, and some other cool stuff as well. So all of this was, was cool back in the day. It made the Game Boy uh, very economical, it made it sell like crazy, and it was super, super good of Nintendo to do this, but it also made it very difficult for me to hack it, right? Like, how could I use such a limited platform to play back modern music? Well, some of these limitations actually open up doors to make this job possible. In particular, on this cartridge here, one of these pins is actually an audio input pin that was never ever used on any real Game Boy game. They put this in here, and they never used it. It's in the schematics as well, and there, there's instructions on how to use it, so I decided why not try to use it. And because the Game Boy offloads so much of its processing to the cartridge, we can put modern chips into this cartridge and kind of do whatever we want with it. So we have total control. But how do we actually design this, right? It's, uh, we have our constraints ahead of us. How do we build a cartridge, test it, and kind of prototype it without spending too much money? Again, I said parts would cost $30. Uh, that was a lie, by the way. That definitely did not work out that way. Uh, well, it's 2019. We have lots of popular hardware platforms we can build on top of. Platforms like the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi that let people put computers into places where computers don't usually go. Uh, so with some of these platforms, or similar platforms to this, we could build something called a cartridge emulator which is essentially putting a very powerful computer into the cartridge itself and pretending to be a cartridge. So kind of listening to what the Game Boy is asking for and then providing the right answer as soon as the Game Boy is expecting an answer. 
Now, the Game Boy CPU runs at four megahertz, which is a fancy way to say that it executes four million instructions every second. We're gonna need a chip on our end that is much faster than that, so that four million times a second we can listen to the questions the Game Boy is asking and return the right data. I did some Googling, and I found this very uh, easy to pronounce chip, the STM32F446ZE. Uh, it runs at 180 megahertz, so it's 45 times faster than the Game Boy itself. It's much faster than an Arduino, and it's also much cheaper than a Raspberry Pi. And crucially, this can play audio for us. So this can play full quality CD audio. And luckily, it only costs $11.35. So I bought a couple of these. I bought some development boards. I opened up an old Game Boy and soldered some pins onto it. And some stuff started working. Uh, so I found some open source code of people who had done similar things to this before. There was a lot of trial and error. Uh, at one point, I kind of let the magic smoke out of some of the chips and some stuff exploded. Uh, but it mostly worked. With some of this open source code and some library code and, and lots of other cool stuff, uh, I was able to write a bunch of C code that went onto this custom chip so that we could play back audio and also watch what the Game Boy is doing. So switch tracks when we wanted to switch tracks, pause the music when we wanted to pause, and things like that. And crucially, to make this process easier, I developed an entire set of make files and Python scripts and stuff like this so that I could hit save in Sublime Text and the, uh, the code would automatically start running on the Game Boy. It was like hot reload, but for Game Boy, which is a 30-year-old platform, and it looked like this. So instead of like Xcode in an iPhone or like a text editor in a web browser, this was my development environment. Okay, so now we have this Franken Game Boy set up. It's all working. It cost roughly $20-ish in parts, plus or minus. Uh, so we have the scene set to develop this custom cartridge. But what's the design we're going to use? How do we actually build this and make it work? Well, the design I came up with can be thought of in a couple layers. The first layer is the Game Boy itself. We don't want to modify this because we want this cartridge to work on any unmodified Game Boy. Right? This should be something that you can play with at home if you get the same cartridge. But we do have total control over the next layer up. And this is the Game Boy cartridge that we've developed ourselves. This has our own custom hardware in it and custom software running on that hardware. And again, this processor is 45 times faster than the Game Boy itself, so the cartridge is kind of like OP in this situation. So this listens to what the Game Boy is asking for, provides the correct answer uh, four million times every second, and this also plays music back. So there's a flash chip on this board, and it'll, uh, it'll put music from the flash chip into this chip, do the decoding of the audio, play that audio out over this output pin, and then go into the Game Boy speaker directly. Now, the layer on top of all of this is actually the code that we want the Game Boy itself to run. Remember, all of this stuff is just running in the cartridge. We want to fool the Game Boy into think that, thinking that it's playing a real game. And this game is Super Pusher Land. Uh, so we modified a copy of Super Mario Land with custom sprites. That's Marty's little character there that he drew. Uh, and we re removed the audio in here so that we don't actually have uh, the Super Mario audio. We're replacing that with Marty's actual album. And then the layer on top of all of this is another collection of custom build scripts and stuff. Uh, so that all of this, all these layers can talk to each other. Uh, there's actually a lot of shared memory in between these three layers. So the Game Boy code can write to memory, and then the C code running on our chip can read from that memory immediately. So it kind of ties everything together. Okay, so after about a month of evenings and weekends putting this entire project together, uh, I ended up with a working prototype that looked like this. And it was working on my desk. I knew it was possible, but this wasn't a cartridge yet, right? How do I take this and put it into a miniature cartridge that you can actually put into a Game Boy? Well, this was new to me. I had to learn about hardware design. It's very difficult. Uh, I thought this was magical, and essentially, it is. Uh, but, <laughs> but what happens under the hood here is all these chips are just components connected to each other with flat wires on these circuit boards. Uh, once I knew that, all I had to do was take the design that I had on my desk, trace every single wire, and copy that wire into a computer-aided design program. This is a program called KiCad. It's open source. It's great to work with. Uh, but each of these labels is essentially me saying, oh, this is the red wire, and it goes from this chip to this chip, and so on. Once I had that, I could copy that onto a circuit board. And this is the same exact electrical schematic. It just happens to be laid out flat on a circuit board. And if I was good at soldering, I could try to solder this myself. I am not good at soldering. <laughs> it did not work. So instead, I sent these design files off to a PCB assembly factory in China. Uh, and I uploaded these files, uh, and they started producing them for me, and it cost about $200 to make five of these boards. And they waited for about a month, and then they came. And they looked exactly like what I had designed. And I was a little bit skeptical that anything would work, and indeed only four out of the five boards worked, but I plugged them all in, and 
they worked. <laughs> All right, so I'm out of time. Uh, this project would not have been possible without a lot of open source code I found online and a little bit of help from some friends of mine and of course from Marty or from Pusher who drew the sprites and whose music we used in the project. Uh, if you wanna try this out, I have this Game Boy on the screen here in my hand right now. It works, I even brought headphones so you can try this in the noisy space back there. But come find me afterwards and thank you again so much for having me, Bang Bang Con. This is great. <laughs> <laughs>